My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained, paranormal, and supernatural happenings that has stained the pages of history. If there were anyone in American history that demonstrated what true evil actually was, it was the Harps Brothers. These men immigrated from Scotland in search of a brand new future, but instead ended the futures for many different people. They became two of the most bloodthirsty killers of the American frontier, and this landed them the distinction of becoming the United States' first recorded serial killers. Now, it's time for a heads up here. Today's episode will be talking about murder, a whole lot of murders. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to bonus episode 19, The Blood Harps. Over 220 years ago, many people say that the devil himself passed through the American state of Tennessee. Now, those aren't just dramatic words to tell you guys a good story. It actually was what the early settlers and terrified townspeople believed when they heard the rumors, read the newspaper reports, and for some, saw with their very own eyes the bodies of the victims. As America was moving towards new lands in the West, these two men moved there too with their own agenda. That agenda of death left at least 28 with some estimates being up to 40 people dead. Their victims usually lay in rivers face up with their eyes wide in terror and their innards were placed with stones to ensure the bodies would sink. Sometimes they were found hacked up and thrown into the wilderness to be scavenged by wild animals. These victims were mostly murdered for the gold that they carried, and the killers they did not care if there were women or men, children or infants. They also didn't care if it was their own family. Nobody was safe from these men who has been named the first documented serial killers in the United States. Mikaja Harp, a.k.a. Big Harp, and Wiley Harp, a.k.a. Little Harp, were serial killing outlaws who murdered their way through Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, and Mississippi during the late 1700s. Often referred to as the Harp Brothers, they were actually cousins who passed themselves off as brothers. The father of both of these men were Scottish immigrants who had settled in Orange County in North Carolina. Big Harp was born to John Harp and his young wife, while Little Harp was born to John's brother William and his spouse. The boys grew up near each other, and they adopted their nicknames in their childhood when Big Harp grew bigger than his cousin. In 1775, the two young men decided to leave North Carolina to go to Virginia, where they intended to find jobs as slave overseers, which to me is a really big, huge flag. But then came the American Revolution, and it derailed their career plans. The pair decided to side with the British as loyalists, but they weren't interested in being loyal to the crown. They were more interested in the violence and the criminal activities that they could get away with while being in the British Army. Joining with like-mind soldiers, they were overjoyed when they burnt farms to the ground, pillaged American patriots, and raped women in their travels. One time, when Little Harp attempted to rape a young girl in North Carolina, he was discovered by a man named Captain James Wood. When Captain Wood saw what Little Harp was trying to do, he shot him. Captain Wood's good deed, though, would not go unpunished. By 1780, the Harps had joined British troops who fought in several battles along the North and South Carolinian borders. The following year, the men decided to leave the army and join up with a band of indigenous people who were raiding settlements through North Carolina and Tennessee, since their favorite pastime was to pillage. But they were also thinking about revenge. After all, do you guys think that men like this would actually let Captain Wood get away with shooting Little Harp? So what did they do? These charmers decided to kidnap the captain's daughter, Susan, and at the same time, they took another woman named Maria Davidson. These women would be forced to serve as wives to Big and Little Harp. The pair, along with their captives and four other men, began to make their way to Tennessee to continue their destruction. 
On the way, a man named Moses Doss dared to become concerned about how brutally the Harps treated the captives who they called their wives. As soon as he spoke up, the men killed him for his concern. After this murder, the group settled in an indigenous village that was located southwest of modern-day Chattanooga, Tennessee. For the next 12 years, the Harps lived with their so-called wives in that village. During this time, both women became pregnant twice, with their children being murdered by their fathers. After the British surrendered at Yorktown in 1781, several breakaway bands of Indigenous people continued to attack the American patriots. The Harps were very happy to help cause more chaos by fighting with the Indigenous people in multiple skirmishes. It wasn't meant to help them by any means. It was just a vehicle for them to be able to commit more crime. By September of 1794, the American Patriots decided to take an offensive stance against the Indigenous people who were attacking them in an area called Nickajack. But somehow, the Bloody Harps found out about this intended attack. They gave no warning to the people who took them in and sheltered them. They decided to flee before the Patriots arrived to wipe out the entire village. After this event, the Harps took their captive wives and settled in a new camp nearby. They stayed at that location for about nine months while they once again pillaged the local villages in Tennessee. By 1797, the group was living in a cabin on Beavers Creek near Knoxville, Tennessee. It was here that Little Harp met a local girl named Sarah Rice. Sarah was a minister's daughter and Little Harp was enraptured. They were married and the two other women became the wives of Big Harp. About a year later is when the men started their murder spree, which is still considered to be one of the most violent in U.S. history. They first killed two men in Tennessee, and by December of 1789, they killed two men traveling from Maryland. Now, what made these killings stand out during these times is that unlike most outlaws, they were not motivated by financial gain. They were motivated by bloodlust. They would often disembowel their victims and fill their abdominal cavity with rocks. They would then sink the bodies in a river. The next victim was a man named John Langford. John was traveling from Virginia to Kentucky, and after his body was discovered, a local innkeeper pointed the authorities toward the Harps. The pair was pursued, and then they were captured and jailed in Danville, Kentucky. But this didn't last very long, since the pair managed to escape. A posse was then pulled together to go search for the pair, but what they found was the body of the son of a man who assisted the authorities. He was murdered and his body was mutilated. On April 22nd, 1799, the Kentucky governor issued a $300 reward, which is about $6,500 in today's funds, on each of the men's heads. They were now on the run, and they decided to flee towards the north. On the way, they killed two men known as Edmonton and Stump. By the time they made their way to the mouth of the Saline River, the Harps came upon three men who were camped there. They killed all three. They then traveled towards Cave in the Rock, which is located in southern Illinois, with the posse pursuing them. The posse decided to stop their chase outside Cave in the Rock, which was known to be a stronghold for the infamous river pirate Samuel Mason. But what they didn't know was that when the Harps reached the area with their wives and now three live children in tow, they joined the Samuel Mason gang. Now this gang's M.O. was to prey on slow-moving flatboats that made their way down the Ohio River. These men were known to be ruthless, but even they were shocked at the actions of the Harps. After Big and Little Harp made it a habit to take the boat's travelers to a top of a bluff, strip them naked, and then throw them off a cliff, the men were told they had to leave. This is where the Harps decided to return to eastern Tennessee, where they upgraded their killing spree. In July of 1798, they killed a farmer named Bradbury, a man named Hardin, and a young boy named Coffey. Soon, even more bodies were discovered, including a man named William Ballard, who was disemboweled and thrown into a river, James Brassel, who had his throat slashed, and then another man named John Tully, who was also found brutally murdered. 
Next came John Graves and his teenage son, who lived in Logan County in South Central Kentucky. They were found with their heads destroyed using an axe. Then the Harps killed a little girl, a young slave, and an entire family who was sleeping at a campsite. Then in August of 1798, Big Harp killed his own daughter northwest of Russell, Kentucky. He bashed the baby's head against a tree just because she was crying. The same month that Big Harp killed his baby daughter, a man named Tobridge was found disemboweled in Highland Creek. Then when the Harps was given shelter in the home of the Stigall family in Webster County, the pair killed another overnight guest named Major William Love and the family's four-month-old baby boy. The Harps became irritated when the baby started to cry and they slit his throat. When Mrs. Stigall saw her baby being murdered, she started to scream and as soon as she did, she was murdered too. The murders continued as the Harps fled west to try to avoid the posse still looking for them. This included Moses Stigall, whose wife and son were murdered by the pair earlier in the month. As the Harps were getting ready to murder their next victim, who was a settler named George Smith, the posse finally tracked them down on August 24, 1791. The posse demanded that the men surrender, but instead of doing that, they took off on their horses. But as they did, the posse shot Big Harp in the leg and in the back. The posse was able to catch up to him and pulled him from his horse. As he lay dying, Big Harp confessed to 20 murders while one of the posse members cut off his head while Big Harp was still alive and conscious. They hung the head on a pole at the crossroads near Henderson, Kentucky. For many years afterwards, this intersection was called Harp's Head. Meanwhile, Little Harp was able to escape. He rejoined the Samuel Mason gang at Cave in the Rock and started using the alias of John Seton. When a large reward was offered by authorities for the head of their leader, Samuel, Little Harp came up with a plan. He and another gang member named James May killed Samuel and cut his head off to collect the reward money. But these men were not that smart. As soon as they brought the head to the authorities to cash in, they were recognized and promptly arrested. The two escaped, but were soon recaptured, tried, and sentenced to hang. In January of 1804, both men were executed in a way that many thought at the time was completely fair considering their crimes. Both men had their heads cut off, and the heads were put on spikes along a local roadside as a deterrent to other outlaws. This act also ended the Harps' killing spree. But our story isn't done quite yet, my dear listeners. At this point, you likely have the same question I did. What happened to the Harp's wives? On the day that the posse found the group and killed Big Harp, these poor women were left at camp. Soon, authorities took the three women and their surviving children to nearby Henderson and placed them in an empty blockhouse. About a month later, on September 4, 1799, the three women were charged with being parties to the murders of Mary Stigall, her infant son James, and Captain William Love. They were held for trial in the town of Russellville, where it was determined they were not guilty. They were then released. Sally Rice, if you guys remember, who actually legitimately married Little Harp, she returned to Knoxville, Tennessee to live with her father. She later remarried a highly respected man from their area, and they raised a large family together. As for Susan Wood, who was one of the two kidnapped women, she stayed in the Russellville area where she also lived a life that was called respectable. The second kidnapped woman, Maria Davidson, she decided to change her name to distance herself from her trauma and the stigma of these events. Under her new name of Betsy Roberts, she married a man named John in September of 1803. By 1828, the couple moved to Hamilton County, Illinois, where they raised a large family together before passing away in the 1860s. Now, just when you think we hit the end of this story, with the violence surrounding this tale, it shouldn't be a surprise that there's a ghostly legend attached to these men. In addition of terrorizing the states of Kentucky, Tennessee, and Illinois, the Bloody Harps were known to have traveled through Mississippi. Between the areas of Tupelo and Houston, Mississippi, there is a place with a spooky name of Witch Dance. This place has been steeped in mystery for centuries for several different reasons. Firstly, it was the home of who were called the Mound Builders of Mississippi. 
Starting approximately 2,100 years ago, these people started building earthen mounds that were constructed for a variety of purposes, with only a small percentage still existing today. It is also said that this area was used by a coven of witches who would gather there to perform dark nighttime ceremonies. Local stories say that whenever one of the witches' feet would touch the ground while they danced in their evil ceremonies, the grass would wither and die, never to grow again. So how do the harps tie into this? At some point prior to his death, Big Harp traveled to this area with an indigenous guide who showed him the bear spots and told him the legend of the witch dance. Big Harp thought that these tales were a joke, so he decided to mock it by jumping from spot to spot, daring the witches to come out and fight him. Now nothing happened at the time, but soon afterwards, Big Harp made his way back to Kentucky where the posse found and killed him. After he was decapitated and his head was put on a pole, it is said that his skull was removed by a witch who ground Big Harp's skull into powder to use into her potions. Soon, word started traveling throughout the community of what happened to Big Harp's remains, and it is said that when people would retell his story, they would hear evil laughter coming from the nearby trees and bushes. Is it Big Harp? Personally, I'd rather not find out, since darkness like this is truly terrifying. Thank you all for joining me today for our latest episode of Horrifying History. What are your thoughts on what you heard today? Why did the harps go on such a horrible and dark crime spree? Join us on Facebook at Horrifying History on Instagram at horrifying underscore history, and on Twitter at horrifying H-I-S-T-1, and let us know what you think. I also have been asked by you guys, what is the best way that you can support this show? Well, the best way is by hitting that subscribe button for my podcast and by giving us a five-star review with your podcast provider. With each subscribe button hit and by giving us a five-star review, you let more people know about our show. And the added bonus is when you hit that subscribe button, you will automatically download our next episode on its day of release. It's a great way not to miss our next episode from Russia with love. Do you guys have a great story that you want to share? Reach out to us at horrifyinghistory at outlook.com and let us know. Perhaps your idea will be our next episode. Also, if you want to bring a piece of horrifying history home with you, check out the spooky items in our store. You can find it by going to redbubble.com and typing horrifying history in their search tool. Thank you so much for listening again today. And until next time.